This is the Detroit Sports Podcast Network. CBD is a game changer sweeping the nation. This hemp extract is the natural way to elevate your mood, eliminate aches and pains, reduce anxiety, and keep you sleeping all night long. It can even cut your workout recovery time in half. Get in the game today with 20% off all orders of CBD and lavender products from Lavender Lane, a lavender farm located right here in Milan, Michigan. Just go to LavenderLaneMI.com today and enter coupon code DETROIT for 20% off your entire order. Guys, look, these amazing products are infused with calming lavender to maximize their effectiveness, meaning your CBD items only take minutes to take effect, which is way quicker than those pills you were about to swallow. On top of it, they are perfect for men and women. Lavender Lane has lab-tested CBD creams, tinctures, and roll-ons that are perfect for any situation, even if you're on the go. Put your health back in your hands by heading over to LavenderLaneMI.com and entering coupon code DETROIT for 20% off your entire order of CBD and lavender products. What do you have to lose? Your satisfaction is guaranteed or your money back. So if you need lavender gifts for your loved ones or just looking for the natural way to ease your discomfort with CBD, go to LavenderLaneMI.com and use coupon code DETROIT to unlock these miraculous benefits of CBD and lavender. That's L-A-V-E-N-D-E-R-L-A-N-E-M-I dot com. And remember, use coupon code D-E-T-R-O-I-T for 20% off your CBD and lavender products from Michigan's own Lavender Lane. It's the Wrestling Perspective Podcast. I'm Dennis Farrell, and he's NWA's own Eli Drake. That's right. And uh, here we are on this beautiful evening. Uh, What do we have to talk about this week? Well, not a lot's happened in the wrestling news, except for one of your own getting in a little trouble. We'll talk about that here in a second. I want to touch on CM Punk. You brought that up in our pre, pre-game, where you want to talk a little bit about CM Punk being back with uh, WWE, but not with WWE. I want to talk about some Survivor Series stuff and, and what that means uh, with the NXT AEW Ratings War. We're talking about your appearance on Stone Cold, which was amazing, by the way. Oh, well, thanks. I was like... Uh, is that just you uh, blowing smoke, or was it actually... like? See, I, I get in this weird thing where I start listening to myself, and I'll go... I, I don't listen to a lot of the podcasts I do, but of course, I had to go back and listen to that one. This is probably, uh, you know, of course, second to this one. Probably the biggest podcast I've ever done. Uh, <laughs> and... Uh, I, I don't know. When I'm sitting there listening, I'm just like, does anybody give a shit about anything I'm saying? Does anybody care about any of these stories? Am I boring everyone out of their mind? Uh, but, I mean, you know, most people said it was pretty good, so who knows? Here's, a, as a friend, I'll give you the truth. I waited like a kid at, at Christmas for it to drop because you were a friend. Stone Cold's podcast is one of those podcasts I only listen to when there's somebody interesting on that he's interviewing. I I think he's good, but he's one of those guys I have to take in doses, and that's not an insult. I mean, when he interviews someone I'm interested in. It's just a fact of life. It, it is, yeah. I, if he interviews somebody I'm, I'm interested in, I'm all in. And it's almost the same way with Conrad Thompson stuff, whether it's you know 89 weeks or you know, something to wrestle with. If they talk about a pay-per-view or something I enjoyed in the 83 past. 83 weeks, it, I think it is. I don't even know. Uh, Something like that. Eric Bischoff show. If, yeah. if it's one of those. I like, the, I like the Tony Schiavone one, but I haven't listened to it in a long time. Is he still doing that, by the way? I, I, I've never, I love Tony Schiavone. Never listened to his podcast. Oh, no, I, I actually thought it was pretty decent, but I didn't mean to derail you. Continue. So, so I waited for yours to pop up, and when it did, I downloaded it immediately, and I listened to it probably five minutes after it hit the, hit the store shelves, as, as they would say in retail, I guess. I thought it was it's good. so funny too because he's he's so him, in the sense that like he's kind of hands off in the sense that like it was just me and him there. He recorded it, but I was like, "So how's this all work?" Whatever. He was like, "I don't know. I just I sent it in. They put it out." And I was like, "Well, when's it come out?" And he was like, "Tuesday, Wednesday, one of those days." And I'm like, "All right, cool." So I was expecting it wasn't coming out till today. So you were actually the first one to let me know that it was out. I, um, I listened. So, I, so I, when you told me, I texted. When you told me, I checked it out, and I was like, "Oh hell yeah, I got to listen to this then." So what did you guys talk about? Let's let's start with this since we're on it now. We, he said that you guys were talking for about 20 minutes before you hit record. What was the conversation like? I mean, I, it was it was super easy to relax. First he came out and met me in the driveway. Uh, 
uh, he came out and he was just kind of checking out my car because I had texted him beforehand, as he, as he mentioned that, uh, uh, it, it, how, how was the parking, whatever. And I know he's got a white Corvette amongst, you know, like 10, 15 other cars. Um, but basically I was just like, uh, asking how the parking was, he told me that there was going to be this, you know, shitty little Ford Focus sitting in the driveway. And I was like, oh, it's too bad. I thought maybe by pulling the driveway, we'd have like twin Corvettes. And he was like, ah, oh, yeah, sure. And, you know, put this little, like, you know, laughing, crying emoji or whatever in the, in the message. So I get over there and he's like, oh shit, I didn't think you were actually going to pull up in a Corvette. And uh, so we started talking about that a little bit. Uh, uh, we're just talking about anything. We're just talking about dogs and wrestling because his dog was hanging out there. I was telling him because everything that had just happened with the dog shop that I uh, go and volunteer for, uh, that stuff happened just the night before. So I was talking about that. Um, uh, but I, I don't know. We, we, I mean, it's just anything and everything. Just super easy dude to have a conversation with. What can you tell me about Stone Cold's house? Because in my mind, Stone Cold probably has... <sighs> All right, so I, I'm not going for the jokes here. This is like what I would realistically view Stone Cold's house as. A, a typical California home where it's probably not as big as you would think it would be. Uh, maybe a three-car garage tops. A four-bedroom place. I would say... And this is all making guesses, uh, maybe a few miles from some sort of lake or ocean. And uh, his wife would have designed most of it, but he kind of has a man cave. Um, well, I can't tell you any of that because I don't know. Um, Did because he not let you in? I, I, was in, I was in the junior house. And what I mean by that is <laughs> he, basically, he basically owns two houses next to each other. <laughs> One of them is the house he actually lives in. The other one is the house that is essentially specifically for the podcast, as far as I could tell. It's essentially his podcast studio that also happens to have, from what I saw, at least two bedrooms and at least one bathroom. Um, so it's just like a small little California house, as you were saying. Um, but I believe, I'm pretty sure, because he was talking about a pool in the backyard uh, of his other one and building high walls so people couldn't see the pool and whatnot, um, I, I'm, I'm assuming there's some sort of nude sunbathing or something going on there. Uh, that, I actually didn't go in there, but we talked about it a little bit because he was saying he has his own gym in there and whatnot because we were both talking about where we train and where we work out and whatnot, and he was saying like he, he doesn't go bother going to Gold's or anything like that anymore because just people bother him and stuff like that, and it's like he appreciates it, but at the same time, it's like he wants to get a workout done. And it's just kind of tough and it's distracting. Not to mention Gold's Gym Venice is so packed with people. It's tough to get like an effective workout in sometimes. So uh, he's got his own gym in his place with just like it's pretty simple basics. It's got like a, a, a rack in it where he can do like squats and deadlifts and bench and uh, presses and all kinds of stuff, pull ups and stuff like that. So, uh, but I didn't actually get to see inside the palace. Although supposedly I'm invited back any time in the future. We shall find out. See, that was going to be my next question. Was at the end he told you you'll text me anytime, come over, we'll hang out. Do you do that? Do you text Stone Cold like, hey, what do you do? And you want to go get some beers? Well, I was surprised to get a phone call from him this past Sunday morning uh, out of the blue. I, that, that was just kind of different. But, uh, you know, I picked up and we just talked for a minute. But most of it was just kind of him getting an idea of uh, just little details. He wanted to narrow down details uh, for things to mention on the podcast when he was introing or outroing or stuff like that. Um, so, I mean... There were personal elements in there, but I don't think it was overall a personal call. Um, but at the same time, I mean, if, if that is happening, I, I'm not going to tell everybody. I mean, I, if I was going to have a personal relationship with somebody, I'm going to keep that to myself. Except for my sweet, lovely Michelle that's making all this noise in the kitchen behind me. And I guarantee you can hear it, and I'll tell you why. Because I've got garbage microphones. Because if you listen to that episode with Steve, he's talking about how, like, my chair – you can probably hear the dog just barking. He was talking about my chair creaking – on his episode, because he also has a creaky chair just like mine. But you know what? You couldn't hear a damn thing. He's probably got, like, an amazing microphone. I need to get whatever microphones he has, because this microphone picks up every single sound in the room. It wasn't that bad. I did not hear the squeaking, and I had headphones on when I listened to the podcast. And I'm yeah. used to the Eli Drake squeak. Right. It seems like every chair I sit in, I, maybe I have a weight problem. I'm not sure, but every chair I sit in has a little squeak to it. Here it is. 
It, I geeked out because I can finally say that my name was said on the Stone Cold Steve Austin podcast, so thank you for oh, that. Oh, boy. And by the way, I felt like I had to tell you how to say my last name after that one interview you did where you're like, yeah, I got fired because of some guy named Dennis Farrell or Firo or Fry, Yeah, I see, I, I, think of the, uh, I think of the musical artist Farrell. No, no, you should think of Will. Will Farrell, yeah, okay. Yeah, that, that, that was a good, uh, that, that was a good um, association. Good, good. Outside of that, I thought it was great. I enjoyed your notoriously late stories. So that was that that showed a little bit more of the human side of you. You you didn't come off like what was me. You owned up, and you were kind of like I screwed up, and I ruined a lot of chances. And that and that kind of humanized humanized you to me. And you know, I actually sat and thought about that a lot after the interview, and I really started picking it apart because. At, we, I mean, we literally sat, I got to his place probably, you know, 10 minutes till noon, you know, one of the rare times where I was actually on time for something. Um, I got there about 10 minutes to noon. Um, and I don't think I left his place till about 2.45 PM. So, I mean, we were sitting there and, and I think the actual runtime of the actual show might've been like one forty or something like that. So there was probably another good hour that we were just sitting there talking because I kind of hung out afterwards, and, and we just kind of, you know, once you turn the recorder off, we still just hung out and chatted, and we talked about all kinds of different stuff uh, until finally, you know, I was just like, ah, I'm going to get out of your hair, get out of here, I'm going to go uh, get a workout in and whatnot. Um, that's right. I was the one to, to, to detach and say I was going to leave. I did it. That was smart, though. I, I, that was smart. <laughs> well, I mean, look, I'm a guest at somebody's house. The last thing you want to do is, like, over – there's nothing worse because I've had it so many times where, like, somebody's over – Either you're ready to go to bed or you got to be somewhere and you're just thinking like, I don't want to be a dickhead, but I just wish they'd leave right now. And, you know, I'm thinking like, well, I don't want to be that person. I was like, so, you know, we've had a good talk to this point. I'll get up. I'll use the restroom. I'll get my ass out of here. That's I I have friends, too. And being around PD, I've seen you have friends, too. I I barely. Uh, Look at you. But being around PD, I've seen that a lot from fans where. You're sitting at the table, you're trying to sell hats or shirt or whatever, and you have the one guy that wants to stay in there and not buy anything. And every once in a while, that's fine, but yeah. he'll spend 20 to 30 minutes just talking to you about nothing. And you can't really say, are you going to buy something or move on? But at the same time, you just <laughs> Some of, guys do that. I, I've seen that happen too, by the way. Tom, uh, Tommy Dreamer has been like, hey. Move on, but I've also seen Tommy say, "Pull up a seat, sit down. I'm going to tell you 900 stories because it's slow." Mo- Moose used to do that. A lot of times we'd be sitting next to each other, and I would I would cringe when he'd do it because I don't know. It just feels it just feels off. Um, I mean, like if you're doing it in character or something like that, I get it. I don't know. Like to me, it's like when I'm on character, I'm on screen doing my shit. It's like that's one thing. But like once I'm actually like meeting the people, talking to the people, I'm going to try to be as reasonably nice as I can. Um, You know, I mean, obviously the people are appreciating me to some point where they want to stand there and talk to me. So it's like I want to give them as much as I can without taking away from the other people. So if there's a way to balance that and make it work, I I try to make it work. I did cringe a little bit during the podcast when he's like, "Uh, have you ever heard of that moose guy? Whatever happened to him? And it's like, (laughs) I felt really bad for moose there. But uh, you know what? Honestly, I I didn't mind the fact uh, (laughs) I didn't mind the fact that he was like, I don't even know where you can catch impact. I was like, yeah, you know, well, there's a couple guys there that I'd like to pie face. So Understandable, but I, I did cringe because it's like, yeah, Moose is like one of the most over guys and he's doing pretty well on the independent circuit stone how, but but i mean but that? i mean he brings up uh he brings up a real thing but i mean how many you know how many of those guys are in touch with the independent circuit first and foremost but then beyond that it's like uh, he, he's not wrong i mean up until just being on access and i don't even know how accessible access is uh who the hell had pursuit and i don't mean that as any disrespect i mean that as an honest question like it, it's just damn hard to find so I completely understand what he's saying. And even, even with Pop, Pop, Pop was eons better than Pursuit. But even then, it's still like how many people really got Pop. So I, I completely get it. Uh, you know what? I'll, I'll say this. Because of Impact and Pop, I really fell in love with Shit's Creek. Have you seen that? Yeah. Well, yeah, because uh, we were the lead-in for a long time there. And I remember just being like – see, I, for a while, I didn't know that was a show on another network. So I was like, oh, is that a – is that a show just on pop? I was like, oh, this is, see if I, I was talking to people at impact. I was like, Hey, ask them if I can get like somehow like read for a role or something. And then I come to find out that it wasn't, 
I don't know who makes that show, but it wasn't just for pop, obviously. I would have to imagine it's a Canadian show. It, it has that cast, right? It does, because uh, the Levies are Canadian. Yeah, and it seems like there's always like kind of that same crew, uh, like the mom from Home Alone and mm-hmm. him. And uh, I feel like John Candy would have been a part of it if he was still around. I would agree with that. That's he'd be like the crazy uncle. Yeah. So, so I guess we should move on. We can touch back on Stone Cold here in a minute. But the big news of the day was. Well, actually, just, just, just before we go, I, I, I don't know if I finished on my point there, but um, I, I did go home and just rack my brain on the whole thing. And I know even when I talked to Steve on, on Sunday morning, I was just like, man, I hope I didn't sound like a whiny bitch or like I was unloading any kind of hardships I may have had in my career on somebody else because I didn't want it to sound like that. Even today on Twitter, I like corrected Somebody posted an article where they just took an excerpt from it, and they were like, uh, Eli Drake talks about his issues with Bill DeMott. And I'm like, I have no that, – that shit was six years ago. I haven't seen Bill DeMott, haven't talked to Bill DeMott. Uh, I have no issue with him. As a matter of fact, I even said on the podcast, I said I enjoyed and appreciated his in-ring coaching style. I like a drill sergeant guy. I like a guy who's like hard-nosed and wants you to take the shit seriously in the ring. What I didn't like – was the out of the ring stuff where there was the disrespectful bullshit and all that kind of stuff. But aside from that, to just pinpoint and be like his issues, that there's, there's no issue. Um, I mean, that was obviously ultimately what ended up with me leaving or, or, or being fired. But at the same time, I have a responsibility for that. I have a responsibility for how do I respond to those things? How do I handle those things? How do I show up on time uh, so that our, uh, so that I'm not loading the gun with ammunition? Um, uh, just different stuff like that. So it was just like, I just wanted to make sure, and I couldn't remember how I'd phrase things. And I just wanted to make it sure that it didn't sound like I was blaming other people for, uh, you know, any, any time where something might've gone awry, because that was definitely not the case. You didn't come off any of that. And even when you were talking about bill, you made it a point to put him over and make it understandable that you screwed up, but you also, uh, push the fact that you probably paid for it five times over than you probably should have. Oh my God. It was so ridiculous. Like, I mean, like, look, okay. The, and I mean, not, not to rehash this, but, you know, everything that was on the Austin podcast, but it's like with the Mattel thing, just being taken off that was an enormous punishment. And like, then it's like, okay, well that sucks. That's awful. And then all of a sudden it's like, well, now you're, you're off SmackDown too. And you're not going to be on the next three weeks of, of live events. And it's like, well, goddamn, like, it, it, it's like I, I, I got a speeding ticket, but instead of, you know, giving me a fine, they put me in solitary confinement for six months. Like what the punishment just didn't fit the crime. I didn't feel like I but guess I, regardless, I, I guess I kind of agree from being an outsider and not really knowing that aspect of the business. Although, you know, I, I got punished too for my, my fair share of stuff through impact and I'm not even employed there. So. <laughs> hey, I mean, it, it, it's it's uh, it, it's two different things, but I mean, there, there's a lot of soft egos in wrestling. Uh, not not saying that any of those people are that or whatever, but I'm saying that's a lot that incorporates into it. Uh, there's a lot of soft egos in the backstage area. Um, uh, just uh, just a lot of that kind of stuff, and then there's a lot of job justification. Um, where you have to make your job seem very important. That way your higher ups do not come down on you and uh, question what you're doing and stuff like that. So it, make, it makes you appear busy. It makes you appear that you are doing your job, I guess, to, I guess, maybe go over the top for certain things. Oh, absolutely. And I love the guys that have no power, but walk around thinking they have the power. I, I get a chuckle out of that. Well, that's most of the damn wrestlers. It's, it's even, <laughs> you know what? It's even better at an indie show. Where, you know, because I'll walk in there and I'm probably, and look, I don't mean to stroke my own ego here, but for just a second, humor me. But I like to think that some of these guys here in Michigan that were not the guys that the promoters, but some of the guys on the show, I might have a little bit of a bigger following than they do. But yet they walk around there like they're they're the cat's meow. Yeah, well, I mean, uh, see, there, there's a fine line there. Some of that's fake it till you make it. Um, I would definitely say I'm sure a lot of people p- probably pointed their fingers at me in that same way because I've always carried my way in a certain or carried myself in a certain way. Um, 
at, at the same time, there's a fine line between carrying yourself a certain way, like you're the cat's meows, you might say, or the cock of the walk, if you will, uh, and being an asshole to people. Whereas, like, I'm quiet, so I'm perceived as an asshole. I've never outright been an asshole to anybody. So uh, that, that whole perception is reality thing is kind of bullshit because it's really like if you're perceiving somebody to be an asshole – without ever really having any interaction with them, who's really the asshole in that interaction? No, I agree. It, you know, when we talked about you before you came onto the podcast, when I, Petey and I would, and I would talk about my perception of you backstage, it was, I was shocked at how quiet and kept to yourself you were. And th- people out there in podcast land, this is, this is Eli Drake backstage from... The many times I've seen him is he walks around with his headphones, his big jug of water, his shirt with no sleeves on. But if I had arms like yours, I wouldn't wear <laughs> sleeves either. And uh, well, especially at that place, though, I was probably about to go to the gym or just coming back from it. Yeah, and and you just kind of kept to yourself. You didn't spend any time in the uh, the makeshift gorilla position or the catering position, which was next to the gorilla position, or. Anywhere like that, if you didn't stretch out in the ring, you were not anywhere but in the locker room or locker room hall, and that was it. Yeah, I, I kind of just mill about a lot. Like, I'll, I'll, I'll move around a bit. Uh, I don't really stay in one place too much, but at the same time, it's like, you know, I'll drop in and talk to somebody for like a, a kind of a split second and move on. But like, I, I that's a funny thing is like, Some people ask me, you know, about like different gossip or maybe something like that. And I'm like, I I really don't know. I keep my nose clean of most of that. So it's like even, you know, anything I've even gotten into in the past, it's like nobody knows or would know because I just, I don't really share that or or talk to that many people. It's kind of like, I just kind of go there. I do my business. I'm friendly with everybody. Um, I mean, I'm sure I've definitely been short with people, um, not on purpose, but just whether I was in a bad mood or whatever. Uh, or maybe I was distracted with something. Uh, I know there was definitely a point when I'd first re-signed uh, last year, and in that like late summertime where it was just like they didn't have a damn thing for me. And I'd remember like Sammy Callahan would come up to me, or Brian Cage would come up to me, and they'd be like, "What are you doing tonight?" And I'd tell them, and they're like, "What the f- what? What are they doing with you right now? Like I don't even get this. Like you're one of our best guys, and you're just..." Uh, you know, you, like I was doing like the open challenge thing, which, which was decent. And it led to like kind of some cool, funny things, but it was like, I, I don't know for the longest time. It was like, I was just kind of floundering around. Um, and, and that's not a disparaging thing, everybody. So calm down. Um, but, but you know, to where even the other talent is noticing, like, what the, what the hell is this? It, it, it be, just became frustrating. So, yeah, I'm sure that to some people I probably came off as short, probably an asshole. Um, I know uh, probably with Joe Hendry for sure, and I didn't mean to because he was, he was a nice guy, but it was just like it was during that whole time where I was just like, this whole thing's so stupid. Uh, and, um, and, you know, I just kind of walk around pissed off and with a chip on my shoulder and stuff like that and uh, just feeling like, you know, I was, I was the damn world champion just a few months ago, I was a tag team champion. A little bit after that, and now it's like I'm damn bottom of the barrel, uh, you know. Because whether it's a, a personal thing or or whatever. Um. So, other than that, barring that, I was always just friendly in the sense of just saying hello, how you doing, blah blah blah, whatever. And for the most part, then after that, it's just I kept to myself. Other than you know my boys, Seidel and Eddie and Moose and Trevor Lee when he was around. Um, and all those guys, but uh, otherwise, I kind of just—I mean, I, you know—I was tight. With, I was tight with Cross and tight with uh, LAX and all those guys. But I mean, still, it was just like once I was there, I was mostly business-minded. Uh, other than you know, set, I was party dad and I'd set up the party bus and you know, going out to the club or whatever we were doing that night. But other than that, there for the business. Joe Hendry was one of those guys I didn't feel like got a fair shake in the States. I thought he could have been really big with the shtick he was doing. And I was a huge fan of him after I saw and got to know him. I I was really disappointed he didn't get a real good look from any other companies over here. Well, I, well, I think the big problem is that <laughs> one of the big issues I had, no matter what the regime was at Impact, was that I would start to get some steam – accidental or not because it was like usually i was a, i was always a heel and then it was like i'd start to somehow they'd start to come around and start liking me 
<clears throat> new regime would come in, and then they'd find a way to kind of pull it back again, build some steam, crowd's getting on me, new regime comes in, or new writing staff, or something like that, and it was like, uh, pull them back, and it was like, I was always kind of that weird tweener, where it was like, no matter if I talk trash on the crowd, if I said bad things about people in the audience, bad things about the baby faces, they still gravitated to me, they still would react well to me, from, uh, you know, about 50-50. So I don't think that it worked out well a couple times for the people that they tried to bring in expecting a different reaction because with the Joe Hendry thing, it was kind of cool the first once or twice that we did it. By the time we got to MediaCon in the UK, mind you, we were in the UK at MediaCon, uh, what was it, last September 2018, I got a giant pop and he got booed while we were wrestling each other. So there's some disconnect there in the way the, the writers were, were seeing me and using me and the way that the, the audiences were, were uh, reacting to me. It was the same thing with, uh, with James Ellsworth at Bound for Glory. They were like, oh, James Ellsworth is going to come out. He's going to get a huge pop. And they're gonna, I'm like, it's not going to work that way. First of all, they're expecting Jericho. And if they get anything other than that, they're going to shit on it. But not only that, it's James Ellsworth. Do you really think people are going to be that excited and, and they're going to believe him possibly going over on me or whatever i was like let's go and do it but it's not going to go the way you think it is and it was immediate f u l's were da, 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 all that and so it was just a, a lot of times i think there was just i i don't i don't know i i don't know what the thought was um but i, I think that those types of ideas are the reason that somebody like joe hendry uh, kind of didn't get a fair shake because once we come into that and it just kind of falters off, wh- where's he got left to go? You know, it, cause I've given, you know, thrown things out to PD cause he was part of the booking and production and all that stuff. And when he told me about the Ellsworth thing, I said, it's, it's going to be stupid. It's not going to work. And he's like, yeah, but her hands are tied. I mean, it ended up being great, eh. but not, but, but, but not in the way they thought. Boy, I don't know if you know the meaning of great. I'm, I'm saying great in the sense of solid ass crowd interaction. The crowd was hanging on every damn thing we said, and it was really good in that sense. And and I'll be honest, I don't think I've ever gotten such a big baby face reaction in my damn life. But that was from the start, from the sen- from the time my music hits. It, you you can go back and watch a pay per view. The time you hear Eli Drake, you pop, you see people just jumping up. And then here I come, I do my thing, I start talking to people or just following every single damn thing I say. I'm trying to shit on New York, they're still on my side. I'm talking trash on, uh, you know, this city's only famous for pizza, they're still on my side. Then this guy comes out, it's game over. But it was still like, they were hot the whole damn way through. The only thing that saved it was Abyss coming out because he's Abyss. My my suggestion, by the way, and I really thought Pete was going to be able to push this through, was I thought they should have had Don Callis come out dressed as Jericho. Oh, boy. No? <laughs> no? Well, I, I mean, yeah, but where, where, where do you go with that? Because that would have been tremendously shot on. Yeah, but what were you going to do with uh, Ellsworth, too? You, you, this, it, it's the same thing. It's a one-off match. You don't have to go anywhere with it. Yeah, I, I mean, the, the only thing it did was serve to, to honestly put me over more, which fine, but it wasn't putting me over in the way that they were intending. Let's let's move on. There's a couple quick questions I have personally before we get into this NWA news. I was I'm watching NWA. I'm listening to you talk about NXT. Uh, and, you know, thinking of WWE, and even Impact, but how much smaller, because it looks smaller, is the NWA ring compared to the other organizations you've been in? Uh, only, uh, it, the only one that's smaller than is WWE. Uh, it's the same size as Impact. Uh, it's an 18 by 18 foot ring, and WWE is the only one that has a 20 by 20. Okay. Because the NWA ring for maybe it's the arena just looks smaller than everybody else's. Yeah, I kind of thought that too when I was in it, um, and I asked, and, and they confirmed it was an eighteen by eighteen. Because I've been in sixteens before. Championship Wrestling from Hollywood uses a sixteen. 
Uh, and it, it's a little bit bigger than that one. So, yeah, it, I mean, obviously it either goes 16, 18, or 20. It's not a 16, definitely not a 20, so it's, it's an 18. All right, let's knock out this uh, unfortunate circumstance with Uh-oh. Jim Cornette and what happened. Apparently they released Episode 7. And uh, Jim Cornette had some unfortunate comments on there. You can look them up if you want. We don't need to talk about them here. Uh, I, you know, maybe I'm out of touch. I don't know if they were. I don't know. I don't even want to get into the comments. But I, I know because you're afraid that the same thing's going to happen to you. A, um, a little bit, but it was. But I don't know. We we maybe one day when this dies down, we can dissect and talk about it and and ask questions. But. Uh, the episode airs. He had said some unfortunate stuff. They pull it. They fix it. They put it back up. Cornette resigns, and I don't know if he was forced out or if he went out on his own. I don't know any of that sort of stuff. Neither do I. My question to you is, how did that even make the ear? If it was that egregious of a comment, how did NWA even let that hit the ear? How is Jim Cornette, granted he said it, but there should be somebody else taking a beating on this because whether he, you know, he said whatever he said and if it was bad or not, how did someone oversee that and still post that show? Well, we don't have, we don't have a giant editing team like, uh, you know, WWE or, or, or anybody else. I, I don't even think, and I know even Impact has a, a kind of a skeleton crew, but even they, I believe, would have at least a couple more ears on everything that's going on. To my knowledge, we have one person at the moment doing the bulk of the editing, and that same person is putting together the 10 Pounds of Gold segments, uh, putting together any of the other video packages that we have and all that. So it's a lot of content to go through. Not that that's an excuse, but unless it's something that's really glaringly obviously out there, I could see how it could slip through the cracks. Um, not only that, um, I, I don't know. I mean, it, it makes it kind of tough to excuse that, but again, you're talking about one person that it's going through with so much stuff, so, such a massive amount of stuff. And, and I just don't know that, I don't know that it was that glaringly obvious at first. I remember hearing it and thinking like, uh, that was a poor choice of food for sure. But I, 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 I think the whole comment was more aimed at hunger than race. I agree. That's my take on it. Uh, but the, the problem is that there was already a group of people just looking for anything there were there's already a large group of people with the guns pointed at him just happened they were empty and they were just looking for somebody to hand him some bullets and he handed them the bullets do you do you feel like the guy editing the show should take any sort of heat because i kind of feel like there should be something that falls upon his shoulders and i'm not calling for anybody's head and maybe if I'm Jim Cornette, I feel a little hung out to dry on this situation where if you say something on a pre-recorded show that still has to go through editing, get put together, and then air, someone should have caught that and fixed it before it hit the air. And I'm Well, not- see, the, t- the, the, the tough thing with that is I, I, I love Jim Cornette, so I, I'm not trying to say a bad thing about him. But at the same time, at the end of the day, the responsibility does still – fall on him because it came out of his mouth and and if he if it lit a bulb off in his head you know he could have made a note to say hey uh maybe you want to take this out or whatever i'm sure it didn't because again in his mind he's this is my belief anyway he's making a comment on hunger and not race but that aside uh, yeah i guess uh, obviously some blame does go to the editor but again i'm just imagining the I don't know. To me, it's human. It's a mistake. Uh, I think it would be easy for something like that to fall through the cracks. Again, when it's not glaringly obvious and you're going through hours and hours. Like, okay, that hour-long show, now we, we taped for the most part, we taped it live in a sense to where it's all like in order, but not all of it. And then you got to consider the ads that they're putting in between, the different cuts that they're doing. So to make that one-hour show... There's probably a good seven or eight hours of editing. 
So you're talking seven or eight hours of editing for that. You know, any little 15, 30 second spot they're putting together, 10 pounds of gold. You're talking about a whole lot of editing and, you know, going back and listening. So you're talking probably in a week, any given week, got to be, got to be in the, in the realm of 40 plus hours of, of editing and listening back stuff. Now, obviously, that's anybody's normal work week. Uh, do people mess up in their normal work week? Probably. And I would say that it's pretty easy, pretty possible for somebody to miss that if you're going into the wee hours. And I don't, I don't know that these are the circumstances. I'm, I'm giving, uh, you know, what ifs because I could see this happening because I've edited video myself. I've done some of this stuff and it takes a very long time. And you can go into the hours of the night. Your eyes start getting glassy. You're just like, oh my god, I got to get this done. It sounds fine. It looks fine. Let's print it. Something like that happens. And I, I, I don't know. I mean, uh, th- that stuff happens sometimes. Hell, uh, what was it? Uh, SummerSlam 1990 when the, the damn or Royal Rumble or whatever it was when that damn sign fell off and Gene Okerlund yells out. Uh, I mean, that was taped and, and that made it out. So, I mean, there's and I'm sure that guy was probably fired. But at the same time, it's like I, I, it, the difference is WWE has a whole team and a whole crew of people to do that stuff. So that one guy might have been fired. But there's, you know, 10 other people to take his place. And at the same time, his one job that day might have been that one piece or a couple other pieces, not the whole damn show and everything that has to do with it. I, I get it. I, I, I get it and I understand it. But at the same time, that's your last line of defense on making sure you don't put shit out. And yeah. if you're going to give the last line of defense that kind of pass on something like this – what what's what's next? You, it, it's not a pass. It's just like I, I can be lenient on it only for the fact that again, it's it's just the it, I think it's the workload. Also, I get that the I guess the punishment's different because you do have Jim Cornette, who is a multi-time offender with whatever he says. He's controversial. So I, I get that there's a – he's held to a different standard than the editing crew guy. In At the same time, if anybody else said it, I don't know if the reaction would have been – it still would have had some, some traction, but I don't think it would have been as bad. So they say that they're going to do some different stuff here to make sure this kind of stuff doesn't get out. Didn't really get into it. You probably don't know. Do you have an idea of what they're going to do to replace Jim Cornette going forward? I think they have to what your next taping is December twelfth or fifteenth. Fourteenth. Um, I and I have no idea. Um, I I don't know. I mean, everything that I've found out has all been via the internet, except for a, a small conversation I had with uh, Nick Aldis last night. Um, uh, other than that, I, I, you're kind of finding out as I find out. Uh, just because I, I don't know, like I, they're they're very busy with whatever they're doing, and unless I need to be made aware of something, that I you know I, I don't bother. Um, Let me ask you this: I, it, It's really funny because it parallels Impact just before I became the champion, where it was like <laughs> Jim Cornette was there for that one taping. It was great, and I was like, oh hell yeah, I'm enjoying working with Jim. And then it was like for whatever reason he wasn't there for the next one. Let me ask you this: If it was up to you. And within reasonable, within reason, maybe even you know, free agents out there. Is there a guy you would pick to take his spot? Oh, man, uh, I don't know, man, because there, there really aren't that many great wrestling commentators still around. So, like, I mean, that his his commentary work, in my opinion, was probably the best best commentary going in wrestling right now. WWE's commentary is so bland and so vanilla. Uh, hell, I wouldn't even call it vanilla. Vanilla would be a compliment because that would actually have some flavor. There's no flavor to, to their commentary. And uh, at least with AEW, um, it, it has that medicinal sound of, of JR and Tony Schiavone. Um, I, I, but I, I don't know. Otherwise, as far as actually putting some passion and some, some feeling into it, I feel like Cornette was just on fire. So I don't know who could replace that at this point. I don't know anybody on the indies, for the most part, who uh, who can put that together. And if they go find some professional announcer or whatever, it's just, I don't know, because that's kind of it, you know what WWE's gone for, is that professional announcer sound. It just it sounds so damn canned. Uh, 
Would you would you put Cole Cabana in that spot for now since he's done it with Ring of Honor for so many years? Could be, but I mean, then you're talking about you know a guy who's the national champion, so it's kind of hard to kind of hard to do that and do both. Hell, they could put me in. I'm not a champion or anything. I'll I'll be a damn good color commentator. I mean, you did just. Uh, w- would you say you just officially turned heel uh, on episode seven? I mean, I was just uh, I was just being me. You don't have to ride the fence. You just brutally beat somebody with like a turnbuckle hook. So it, it's okay to say, eh, you know, I'm, I'm kind of a heel. Hadn't, any, hadn't anybody ever gotten on, uh, on your nerves before? Just under your skin a little bit and you just, you know. Every week on do Wednesday something about nights. it. See? <laughs> but no, uh, let's, let's move on. There is a game I want to play with you. And wait, Uh-oh. is there anything else about this that we should talk about or you want to bring up? By the way, Episode 7, great. Still, still, NWA is probably one of the smoothest, easiest watching shows out right now. Uh, if I had to rank them, I, I stopped watching WWE, not because I'm trying to make a statement or I think the product's horrible. and yeah, I'm That's just, the most annoying thing. I'm just not going to watch it. That's not why. It's, you know, I find myself during football season watching football on Monday nights, Friday nights. I don't nights. understand the brand loyalty stuff. Like, everybody's like, oh, AEW, yeah, WWE, screw you, AEW, whatever. And it's like, can't you just watch both? I don't Can't you just enjoy that. both? Oh, yeah, that reminds me. The Survivor Series thing. So coming up this week is Survivor Series pay-per-view. Uh, I don't have the card in front of me, nor are we going to go through and talk about the matches. That's not what we do here. But this year, it's NXT versus Raw versus SmackDown. Now, hear me out on something. I think more than ever, if I were booking something, I would put NXT over like Rover in this pay-per-view. I would have them dominate this pay-per-view. Because it's the only brand right now going head-to-head with AEW. And some weeks they close in, some weeks they fall behind in the ratings. And I really feel like if you put NXT over and you make a big statement and you have the people that watch Raw, you have the people that watch SmackDown that may not watch NXT, you may be able to draw some fans over to that product and help that that in the ratings war against AEW as opposed to giving your A brand or your big billion dollar brand the rub of winning a pay-per-view that nobody's going to remember in two months and it probably won't help either brand. I think from a rating standpoint, NXT really needs to come out ahead in this pay-per-view to help them against AEW because that right now is the only brand you have going head-to-head well with you know a competitor i suppose so but at the same time uh they've got one big conglomerate that they really need to appease and that's fox so uh i don't know that it'll drive any more viewers if smackdown goes over or looks really strong but i i i feel like that's their main i feel like that's kind of their baby now i feel like even raw has kind of become second best in that sense only because of the whole fox thing um I feel like Raw is kind of self-sustaining because it's just been there for so long. It's on the wrestling channel, so to speak, what's been the wrestling channel for the last 30 years, USA. Um, and, yeah, I guess Fox is the one where it's like SmackDown, you got to gotta bring it. And the AEW thing, it's kind of like that's like an image thing, but I don't think that they really – like that's the tertiary brand, I think, still in, in everybody's mind. Um so I I think that what you're saying could make sense, although I don't know if it'll drive more viewers. It could. What If you were in the position of having to worry about that stuff for WWE, what would you worry about? Uh, you know, granted, Fox is the billion-dollar baby right now, and you have something like AEW, which is kind of growing like weeds, and it can really be a thorn in WWE side if they don't really come out and and start winning the ratings war, which doesn't really mean much anymore or nowadays. Yeah. It's not like do I, or die, but... Yeah, it's not like anybody... I don't think anybody's putting anybody out of business. Um, I, 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 I don't think that that ratings war really 
matters that much other than just kind of, I think it matters to AEW more than it matters to WWE. Um, because if AEW comes out on top, it looks like, okay, well, you know, we're beating WWE. Okay, cool. Great. But they're not, uh, because I think what their, their peak was their very first week. And Mm -hmm. since then it's kind of fallen off now, you know, they regained a little bit and they were like 900,000 or whatever it was, but what's SmackDown do on a bad night, 2 million. Um, so it's like, it's, it's not even a contest if you're talking about company versus company, but you're talking about, again, a tertiary brand versus the entire company of AEW. I don't think that in the grand scheme of things, it matters that much other than a, uh, you know, uh, image victory for AEW when they, when the, the ratings were quote unquote. And I, I kind of feel like if WWE really wanted NXT to to win that ratings war, they could easily stack the deck and, and change the tide whenever they want. How so? Because it seems like they've been trying, at least with, like, you know, sending more. But but see, they've been sending these guys down to go to NXT, like, uh, what is it, the, the OC and, and, and uh, Finn Balor and all these guys. But at the same time, I feel like even without AEW, they'd have done the same thing because it's a new show. Because it's kind of the same thing they did with ECW back in the day. Well, I think there would be small things I would do. Uh, like I having them win Survivor Series or having more NXT talent and then pushing what night a week it is on, on your two other brands. I don't know what oh, they're... Oh, for sure. But they haven't done a good job of that If from a fan's point of view. I, I think there's things they could do if they really wanted to close the gap. or Look, if WWE started winning the ratings war, I don't think... I think it could kill AEW's momentum in a lot of towns because they no longer have that, you know, we're taking uh, Triple H's baby and we're beating it each week in the ratings war and soon we're coming for, you know, X, Y, and Z. That's kind of the feather in their cap right now. But you take that away, then they automatically become the clear-cut number two brand and no, and nothing else about it at that point. Yeah, well, I mean, I, I think until they can do the numbers of the flagship shows anyway, they're, they're clear-cut number two brand. All right. I, I, I kind of think we were agreeing to disagree here. Really? I, I don't know how you could. I, well, I mean, I did just talk for four minutes about it, and although my argument might be weak at best. Well, no, well, no I, I get that. But what I'm saying is, if you, I mean, if we're going strictly by the numbers, which is how everybody measures everything – the, the numbers for AEW don't match up. They don't even come close to SmackDown or Raw. Uh, as far as attendance is concerned, WWE can go anywhere in the world uh, and do a decent-sized arena. Uh, you, uh, pay-per-view buys, subscription buys, they have a more uh, large uh, worldwide exposure for WWE. Well, I'm not talking about Raw and SmackDown. I'm just talking about what they're going well, up yeah, against. Come on now. You're talking about clear-cut number two company well, or number one company. Well, hang on now. you you, you, got, you got to be able to beat the flagship. If your flagship show ain't beating the other company's flagship show, you're number two. Uh, clearly, they're number two. I'm not arguing Well, that. I mean, well, that, that's what I was saying. Eli, Eli, hang on here. Hear me out. Come on. I'm coming up there right now. Hear, hear me out. What I'm saying is right now they're beating Triple H's baby. NXT yeah. every week in the ratings, which the tertiary brand. Well, call it what you will. Will minor league tertiary. Call it what you will. The, the C brand, whatever you want to call it, sure. But <laughs> each week they have a victory over a WWE brand. Okay. If, if you take that away from AEW, they have zero bragging rights. They absolutely. Just, and, and that's where I'm coming from. Like, sure, they're not going to do anywhere close to Raw or SmackDown for at least five years. So and, then we're saying we agree to agree. <laughs> well, uh, I'm putting an asterisk by it. How about that? Oh, boy. All right. So, listen, we're, we're running out of time here. There's a game I want to play with you, Eli. How much time do we have? As much as we want, I guess. I, oh, okay. Well, then how do you run out of time when you have infinite amounts of it? Well, you have babies to take care of. I do. They're running around like crazy right now. I think one might have peed under this desk I'm at right now. Oh, that's so sweet. So so here's what I want to do. 
And by the way, if you guys hear dogs barking in the background, Eli got saddled with two dogs, which sounds like it may be forever now. It might, it might accidentally be forever. My, my fosters are, uh, and not because I am, you know, failing and deciding to keep them, but because the, the shop might no longer exist. What would, would you change their names or would you keep their names? Well, that's the funny thing is when I picked the dogs up, they were like, uh, we were asking if we get to name them. They were like, oh, they might have names. Uh, and we were waiting. Nobody gave us a name. So we left. And on the way back, we just started naming them. And then I told the lady, I texted her. I said, hey, we're calling this one this and this one this. And she was like, oh, we'll call the shop because they have names for them. And it'll be easier to uh, adopt them out if, if people know the names. And I'm like, okay. So I called the shop. Nobody ever called me back. And I said, well, screw it. I'm sticking with the names we got. And I like them anyway. So I've got Tuna and I've got Felix. And the one's Tuna because he's chunky. Little chunky Tuna. I, I like it. That's cute. All right. Yeah. My game. I'm going to name a – it's almost a word association game. I'm going to name a whole Uh-oh. bunch of wrestlers off, and I want you to tell me what comes to mind, whether it's a funny story, whether you like them, you don't like them, which knowing you, you probably – you know not too many people you don't like. But, I mean, feel free to talk freely about some of these guys. I'm just randomly picking a whole bunch of guys because I don't know who you know or don't know, and I think it would be fun to, to do it this way. Are you down for this? Let me think. Let me think if I'm down for this. Let me think if I can do something like this. This is a daunting task you're asking for right now. I know. Uh, well, well, Come let on, me see. Life. Come on. I welcome everybody to the World Association Wrestling Game. I am your host and your contestant, Eli Dre. Take it away, Dennis. Boy, I never felt more like Andy Richter in my life until then. All right. Uh, let's start with our truth uh, I did his entrance in the 2K games, and I loved it. It was amazing. So if you see, if you play the game, which, by the way, 2K20, I know there's a lot of stuff going on with there. seems like everything I'm touching in the last couple months is, like, riddled with controversy. Um, but... Uh, I did his entrance way back in the uh, 2K16, uh, and it's amazing, and I killed it. But I've never really had a lot of interaction with him other than a handshake, hello, nice to meet you, and he's been nothing but cool and uh, good to me. Roderick Strong. Uh, Decent dude. We worked a solid match together back in 2012 at FSW. How about Finn Balor? I uh, don't have a lot of uh, interaction with him, really. I mean, met him at the uh, Performance Center when he very first came in, and my ass was on my way out about a week later, and that was about our only interaction, I think. Johnny Impact. Johnny Impact. Love him. All right. The Miz? Uh, and very little interaction with him as well. All right. Although, when I was at NXT, people used to call me Jacked Miz, <laughs> which I never got because I don't, I, don't I don't think we look similar. Uh, I don't think that we do all that much similar, except maybe once or twice when I've worn a suit. But I don't think that we talk similarly, but what can you do? Ray Mysterio Jr. Uh, cool dude. Uh, good dude. We, we got to do a little spot together down in uh, Tijuana about two years ago. Did you get tested afterwards? <sighs> Did I get tested? Yeah, because nothing good happens in Tijuana. <laughs> I mean, it, it was a pretty quick in and out, but uh, now that you remind me, maybe I should go get tested. But uh, he gave me a solid 619, and at first I thought you were going to tell me he was going to transmit something to me through that move, but I guess we're good. Yeah. How about Jeff Hardy? Awesome dude. Great dude. Uh, I actually have a better connection, I think, with Matt than with Jeff, but, uh, uh, but yeah, Jeff's always been good. All right. Let's see here. How about uh, Dash Wilder? Love him. Actually, just hung out with him in Vegas. Uh, what was it? Whenever, whenever SmackDown was in Vegas, just a few weeks ago, uh, I was hanging out with him and Buddy Murphy and uh, uh, Scott Dawson for a little bit. Uh, Daniel Bryant. Uh, very little interaction with him. Great dude, though. Um, I met him way back in 2008 at a Ring of Honor show, and then uh, he was rehabbing at the Performance Center back in 2014 uh, when I was there, and you know, just hanging out, chatting, talking. Very smiley, uh, always smiling and, and laughing and whatnot. Dolph Ziggler. 
Uh, again, little little interaction with him. Actually, I, I know his brother decently well. His brother comes to my parties sometimes, or we'll roll around in a ring up here in Burbank together sometimes. Uh, he was at Johnny and Pac's birthday party just last month, but uh, you know, just very casual here and there, but no real big interaction. Kenny King, love Kenny King. All right, let's see what else we have uh, here. Uh, uh, Kenny King's my dude. Is he really? I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah, we're yeah, we're tight. If I go to Vegas, I'll hit him up. We we've done the the mocap games together. Um, man, I did, way back doing uh, all the Vegas shows at FSW, we, we we always cross paths. Always cool. Dalton Castle. Uh, limited interaction. Uh, <laughs> rarely do I feel like you actually get the real him. Um, but uh, seems like seems like a decent guy. He's always. Uh, He's always been complimentary. That's one guy I think if I had to put together a list of guys I'd like to meet, I think he would be on it because he just seems so interesting. I am animated at, uh, at meet and greets, but he is, uh, he is 100% completely over the top in his gimmick at the, uh, at the meet and greets. Eric Young. Uh, good dude. Solid dude. How about Frankie Kazarian? Uh, I like him, of course. I mean, he's part of SCU. I'm good with all those guys. Um, uh, but yeah, I mean, Frankie, I'm not super tight or anything, but, uh, you know, Sky's the one that I'm tight with, but Kazarian's cool. EC3? Uh, that's, man, that's one of the guys I was always hanging out with before he left. Uh, part of ZNA. ZNA. What, what is that? ZNA. I can't talk about it, but, uh, it was a <laughs> select, select group of guys, uh, uh, man, it, it's actually wide stretching and ever evolving, but it, I think the original group was like EC3, DJZ, Robbie E, all, all e, e names apparently. Um, I think Eddie Edwards, I don't know. And eventually then it stretched out to like me, Seidel, Moose, T- Trevor Lee. Uh, I think that was, I think that's mostly the group there. Teddy Hart. Uh, good dude. Uh, Obviously, he's been in a lot of trouble and whatnot, but he's always been super cool. And he always carries around his cat like a super villain. Yeah, that's so weird, isn't it? <laughs> I remember he, he had first come back uh, to Impact in like 2017. We were doing some shows up in like uh, Rahway, New Jersey or something. And uh, he popped in and he's got, you know, the full regalia on as far as all his clothing. And, uh, and then he's just carrying this white cat in his arms. I'm like, this guy is on another level. I'm trying to. I'm, I'm looking through this list, and I'm trying to th- think of names that you might know because I don't want to ask a question of someone you. You want to know somebody I hate? Who? I don't know. I can't tell you. I'm not sure. There's got to be. I. You know, not that you would tell me because I. I think that you would. You would not uh, air any dirty laundry on a podcast like that. Uh, <laughs> it would never mind. No. <laughs> never, never. Never mind. How about uh, Luchasaurus? Yeah, no, I, I dig Luchasaurus. Uh, uh, we've done a lot of uh, bar wrestling work, of course. Uh, we've, we've we've rolled around here and there. I, I think we have different um, different philosophies on in ring style, but uh, I don't know. I, I've always dug him, always liked him. Uh, easy guy to get along with, and he hooked me up with a really great uh, chick that makes my gear and makes his gear. Oh, that's uh, uh, people don't know this, but you guys have to buy your own gear. A lot of people yeah. think that the organization... It's expensive as hell. Would you think there'd be like a one-place shop for wrestling gear at this point in the industry? I, I mean, you can get stuff at high spots, um, but I, I, I haven't gotten anything at high spots in probably 10 years or more. At the same time, I like to have somebody local to where I can you know, go try on the stuff. If it's not working out, I can go back and take it back over there and be like, hey, can you... You know, tighten up this, loosen up this, you know, whatever. Um, and then plus, you know, if I have something that's like, like my jackets, for instance, I, I buy those jackets and then I just have somebody uh, like like the uh, the jackets I wear to do interviews mm-hmm. and whatnot, those leather jackets. Like I'll buy those and then just have, you know, somebody add the, the logos on the back and whatnot. So like in the middle of her making all my trunks and uh, vests and everything, it was like, well, hey, I've got this jacket too. Can I come by and drop it off? And you can add everything on the back. Is I find it weird, and this might be just me being judgmental, and if you fans out there or people that do this, I apologize for thinking it's weird. 
But uh, peop- the, I've seen you sell some of your gear online. I always find it weird. You know what? I never have, though. No? I, uh, I, I put up the thing for it. I, I have a mailbox full of emails, and I just I think I responded to two or three of them, and then I got tired of it. So I've still got everything still sitting here. I've got three replica belts that I'm trying to get rid of. You can't, you can't get these. These don't exist anywhere. I had them custom made, um, but they were – I wanted them done, redone, so I got redone the way that I wanted them. Um, and so I've got these three replica belts. There's one tag team title. There's actually two impact world titles, the Eli Drake version, the one that I wore pretty much nobody else had it except was it Austin Aries for like a month or something before they gave him the new one. Um, but yeah, I've got both of them. I'll sign them. I'll put them out there. Anybody wants to get them, just uh, DM me. Uh-huh. But, uh, yeah, but, but yeah, I haven't sold any of that stuff yet, but yeah, there's a lot of people who will sell their gear and I'm like, what, what do you? How do you do that? It seems like actually a great idea for anything that you don't want. But for the most part, I kind of want a lot of my stuff because I'm like, if there's a big match that I had or something like that, I'm like, man, this would be kind of cool to have. Like, you know, if I have kind of like a trophy room, if you will, at some point down the road, it's like, well, I could have these boots. I have a picture of me in them. You know, if I won this title here or did this. Or... Yeah, I think it's weird when guys buy that kind of stuff. Like, you know, it. <laughs> I, well, there ain't any girls buying it. I like you. I think you're great, but no way would I ever buy a pair of Eli Drake, uh, you know, ring worn trunks. Well, you- okay, now the the trunks thing I can kind of get, the boots thing I can kind of get because of the fact that you can say like, you know, yeah, Hulk Hogan wore these trunks when he slammed Andre the Giant or something. I'd be like, okay, that's kind of cool. And like you got you got the trunks plus like maybe like a picture of it happening or something like that. That's that's kind of badass. I get that. At the same time, the weird stuff you get is when guys are like, hey, what do you wear under your trucks? Can I buy that? Can I buy the socks that you wrestle in? Uh, you know, different shit like that. And it's like, ah, uh, that's a little strange. And I've heard the girls talk about, uh, you know, some guys will get their fan mail address and send them uh, pantyhose and stuff like that and ask them to wrestle in them and then not wash them and send them to them. Boy. Boy, it's, oh boy! It's got to be rough being a female wrestler. I could only right. imagine. That's oh gosh, that 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 makes me cringe. I mean, I get I get a good amount of like creepy, really creepy stuff in my in my DMs, but I can't imagine the sheer volume of creepy emails and messages that the girl wrestlers get. Like, hey, Eli, will you do a Women wrestlers, excuse me. Don't let me offend anybody. I, I forgot that the word girl is offensive now. <laughs> Eli, will you do a podcast with me? Well, oh, that's creepy. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, that, that was probably the creepiest one. It, he, but it worked. I had you at hello. I mean, that's a little strong. Uh, okay, I had you at please. <laughs> sure, yeah. That, that works out good. All right, let's wrap. The, hey, pay-per-view coming up. Big view December 14th and Atlanta, but that's already sold out. So guess what you could do? You can get it on Fight TV on the Fight app. Uh, so is Fight TV and the Fight app the same thing? There's, there's F-I-T-E. Yes. I know that's what we're on. Um, anyway, Fight app, get it there, December 14th. Catch it, catch me, the NWA, into the fire. Are you, you it looks like, are going to wrestle Ken Anderson at the pay-per-view? Uh, we shall see what happens as the weeks roll along, sir. I mean, unless they're going to turn it into a tag team match, or you're going to book someone else in your place because you're. I don't. I don't know if he's going to be back now. I kind of bashed him in with a, with a steel turnbuckle, so he might. He might be done. He might retire now. Well, that's you know what. Uh, he was a good guy. Uh, had a great career. I'm yeah. sad to see him go out like that. But you know what? In all honesty, you, you don't turn your back to you. You just don't. That that was Bush League. I like that you said you do, you don't turn your back to you. Yeah, yeah. Don't you turn your back to you? Don't don't. don't. Uh, well, I mean, you know that that's the first lesson in uh, uh, somewhere. I'm sure it's a lesson somewhere. Don't turn your back. And by the way, I geeked out to listen when you were on Stone Cold, and you're like, "Yeah, I got a podcast." And he's like, "You got a podcast too?" Like you were, <laughs> you two were the only two guys that have wrestling podcasts. Well, no, he was probably like, you have a podcast, too, like every other wrestler on earth. Uh, I feel like everybody and their brother has a wrestling podcast at this point. But guess what? We got the best one going today. Yeah. I think we have a different one. Uh, here, 
little do people know, Eli, one of my pitches to you was, look, we're going to do this podcast, but we're just going to sit and talk wrestling. And if you listen to any wrestling podcast with wrestlers, none of them are doing timely stuff. They're all looking back at their careers or telling stories on their careers. They're not really focusing too much on what's going on now or talking about the politics of wrestling or just just talking wrestling like two guys would watching a pay-per-view kind of like we do. Sure, I'm probably talking myself out of all kinds of jobs at this point. Hell yeah! Not all of them, just a few. <laughs> okay, where can people find wait, you? Wait, by the way, hold on, we yeah. can't go anywhere yet because it's been a little while. Been a little while. We need a uh, we need a single dentist update. Uh, well, oh, and blue chew. So I'll give a blue chew here in a second. After hey that. now, uh, well, they go hand in hand. Let me see here. Did I tell you about uh, having to meet this girl's parents? No, you did not. I didn't even know you went on a date and you're already meeting parents. Uh, I, I've gone on several. Uh, so I went out with this girl. We went day drinking. How'd you meet her? Uh, Tinder. Tinder, okay. We went. What, day- what, apps, what apps are you on, by the way? Uh, you know, I got off a lot of them, but I think I'm just on Tinder and like the new Facebook dating app, and that's it. That's a thing. I didn't know it was a thing. It is a thing. It, I like okay. the Facebook better than Tinder, but... See, I, I like Bumble better than Tinder. See, I, th- I did like Bumble a little bit, but... I, uh, so, I, I I went out day drinking with this girl, and we started about 1, and it's like 7 o'clock. <clears throat> we're not super drunk or anything, because we were, you know, moderate and eating and taking our time, and sometimes we nurse them, but still yeah. day drinking. About seven seven thirty rolls around, and she's like, "Listen, um, <clears throat> what day of the week is this, by the way?" It's Saturday. It's a Saturday okay. night. She goes, "Listen, at this other bar, about ten minutes away, they have a Neil Diamond impersonator, and halfway through his act, he changes into an Elvis impersonator. Do you want to go see him?" I'm like, "Fuck yeah, I'm all in." This all the concert, yeah, this is going to be great. So uh, I follow her over to the bar. We pull up, I sit down, we pull up, and we're walking up to the door. She stops and says, "Uh, listen, uh, before we walk in, I forgot to tell you something. I go, okay, what's what's up? She goes, "Uh, so my mom, my dad, my aunt, my brother, a couple cousins are in there, and maybe a few other family members are all inside this bar right now. So you're rolling up on the family reunion. Uh, yeah, and I'm like, you, you forgot to tell me? She's like, uh, y- yeah, I forgot to tell you. I go, so what, what, the, what are we going to tell them? She's like, well, I don't know. I'm like, uh, I'm guessing you don't want me to tell them and excuse oh, my that's, language. Here. That's, that's easy. Well, this, this is my friend Dennis. Well, see, that's what I would thought. But I go, I guess you don't want to tell them that you met me off a of fuck site because essentially <laughs> – that's, why, why has it got to be that? Well, what else is going on on Tinder? Ah, come on. What else? I've, I've, I've met a girlfriend on Tinder. Yeah. Did you sleep with her in the first two dates? I did, yeah. See? Did, I, I, think, I think every girlfriend I've ever had I slept with on the first or second date. Well, I mean, look at you. You're Eli Drake. Oh, boy. I mean, come on. Well, I mean, look, if, if they're not doing it in the first or second date, I'm figuring they're not interested anyway. Well, there's another story for another podcast. But anyways, uh, so I, she's like, if you want to turn around, I don't blame you. I go, you know what? If I turn around now, the story ends here. I said, you know, whether I see you again or not, if I walk through those doors, this makes this date so much more of a better story to tell my friends. So I'm going in. So we walk in, we sit down, I meet a few of the family, and I'm watching the show, and our mom is trying to talk to me, and I look over, and she's trying to cuddle with me, like, with her mom. Who, her mom? No, no. Oh. The girl. I thought you already cuddling with her mom. I was like, all right, go ahead and move. With with her mom and dad sitting yeah. on the other side of me, and I'm feeling really awkward here, because, you know, it's like, holy shit, I'm in the middle of a family reunion on a first date with this girl. So after well, about, she's comfortable. Uh, could, could be the other way. Well, you know, I'll say this: um, there was a misrepresentation of her pictures. Also, uh, 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 yeah, that's the worst. And and look, I think I'm a okay looking guy. 
you well, know. Wait a minute. Okay. Well, hold, well, hold on. Hold on. Hold on. So, if there's a misrepresentation, miss. Whoa. Wow. I sound drunk at this point. If there's a misrepresentation of her uh, looks via, via her photos at this point, you had to figure that out kind of early, though, right? So, how do you get to the point that of going to another bar with her? Because that's the point where you'd be like, all right, I'm going to exit out of here. Or was it one of those where it's like, well, I'm already here, so if that's, it ends up there, it ends up there. That's that's it. I knew. That, okay. I knew that, that's that's guy thinking. I get it. That I knew that it wouldn't go any further than going out and drinking or having fun together because I yeah. was a little bit irritated. But at the same time, it's, well, I blocked this day off. I might as well go make the best of it because I could be sitting by myself at a bar day drinking. So I might as well. So, right. So I'm sitting there. She's cuddling up to me. I've got her parents on the other end. I'm starting to feel uncomfortable. I go, you know what? I look over at her and said, hey, uh, do you want something to drink? She's like, oh, yeah, great. I was, awesome go to the bar and walk right out the door into my car. (laughs) All right. Start my car. I pull away. It's 15 minutes from my house to the bar. And in those 15 minutes, I had 37 text messages. Wow. Wow. 37. So, okay. So, so you were, you were uncomfortable with the family being there. Oh, absolutely. Wouldn't you be? I, I don't, you know, I guess it depends on the presentation because, like, I've I've had girls before make a big deal about meeting members of my family when it wasn't like, like I can remember one girl that I was kind of like casually dating. Uh, she came to one of my wrestling shows, and it just so happened that one of my dad, uh, one of my dad, my dad, <laughs> one of the girls I was dating, and my dad came to the same wrestling show, and they just happened to meet because they were just there, and it was like, oh, hey. Uh, Aaron, this is my dad. Dad, this is Aaron. And, you know, some girls make a big deal about that, but it's just like, well, they're here, so meet up. But the whole idea of taking you to a place where it's like the whole damn family, like I'd have just been like, ah, man, you could have told me about this before. But at the same time, it's like, I don't know, kind of roll with the punches. But I don't know. If I was turned off by what showed up as opposed to the pictures, I'd have been nice, had a couple drinks with her, and then been like, all right, well, I'm going to get out of here. Blah, 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 whatever. Nice meeting you, and bye-bye. You want, do, you, but yeah, that kind of sucks to just kind of dip on her. Well, hang on now. I mean, I'm put into this situation now, because if she would have just sat yeah. there, it would have been all right. But now she's... Well, wait, come. yeah. At what point does she tell you about the family? At, at the door. Oh, my God. Yeah, that's that's too much. I mean, I mean, unless she just found out, then I guess I get it. But I think she already knew, and she knew for a while. Because she waited until we got to the door of the bar. Now, if she would have told me earlier, like, look, uh, there's this really cool thing. Downside is I got some family members there. Do you still want to go? It'd give me time to digest it and think about it. Opposed to we're standing at the door. Yeah, that, yeah, that's poor form. And I was a little irritated by that. You put, you know, put on top of... Uh, it was a, a, I don't want to use the word gross misrepresentation of her looks, but it was not good. <laughs> the double entendre you just used right there? Yeah, it was not okay. a, a very fair uh, to me representation. It would be me telling a girl I look like Eli Drake and then Dennis Earl shows up. Well, I mean. <laughs> you see where some girls may be upset? <laughs> I mean, it, look, there's there's nothing – that that's pretty annoying. Yeah. So, and then she tries to, to cuddle up on me. I'm like, ah, no bueno. I'm I'm out. I can't do this. And I, I, I hit the door and I 37 text messages, 37 in 15 minutes. That's crazy. That's nuts. I mean, like to to send you one fu text message and maybe a follow up is one thing, but 37. Uh, wow. Yeah. So. She's uh, she's a complete psycho. So do you know what I... But then, then again, she probably was just thirsty. You, you'd set her up. She's waiting for this drink the whole time. At least if you told her you are going to the bathroom, she wouldn't have any expectations. Yeah, well, I guess uh, I messed up there, huh? But you know what I <laughs> it did? It happens. You know what I didn't need that night, though? I've done the same thing, though. Yeah, you see? I, it's not the first time I've left someone at a bar. In my younger days, believe it or not, Eli... There was a period in my life where I was actually a really attractive guy. 
I was I was getting girls I probably shouldn't have been getting at that point in my life. So <laughs> I'm I mean, I, I, I've been to people's house and just like left, and I'll, I'll be like, "Oh, hey, I left something in the car," and then I'll just dart. I I, I did that at a bar. Uh, I went out with this girl who came back into town, and she's like, "We get to the bar and we're drinking." She's like. Um, so here's the deal. If you're going to, you know, fool around with me, you're buying all the drinks tonight. I'm like, Oh, and then she starts ordering all these expensive drinks. We're talking like $20 drinks. And yeah, and I'd I'd say, all right, see you later. And at some point I, I, I kind of did that, but instead I army crawled out the front door so she wouldn't see me. (laughs) Well, you know what though? Because that, that is, that is the height of arrogance to tell somebody you're going to finance my night out. And so if you ask me, she or anybody who does that with guy, girl, anybody deserves that. So I I would say run that tab up and then leave her with it because how, how much of an asshole are you to go out with somebody and say, Hey, uh, yeah, we're going to, we're going to, you're going to pay for everything that I have tonight. And she's acting like she's giving, giving you sex uh, doing a favor to you, uh, it's so ridiculous. Like, that's supposed to be a two-way street, right? Sex is supposed to be two-way enjoyable. It's not supposed to just be one way. It's not like you're the only one getting enjoyment out of it. I would hope not. In that case, you might need to go and get some lessons here, get a couple run-throughs. Uh, but, <laughs> but regardless, like, it's so ridiculous to act like she's doing you a favor that you need to finance her night out. I think you did the right thing. But with Blue Chew, you don't need lessons. I was going to say, I hope you didn't take your blue chew that night. You, you know, I, I have done Don't that. waste it. I've done that once uh, in this time period where it's like, oh, yeah, take the blue chew and nothing happens. And I'm like, oh, no. Yeah. I'm like, oh, no, because now I'm driving home with a blue chew hard on and it's like, oh, oh no. No, no, no. But uh, go get your blue chew. Go to bluechew.com. Use the promo code perspective with that promo code. Eli and his puppies will send you a free order of blue chew all you have to do is pay for shipping and handling and now that he has you know taken on the responsibility of raising these two orphan dogs he can't really afford to pay people's shipping and handling anymore so that's right that's on you guys at this point so go i'm it. over here shipping them out complete with puppy piss ready to rock hot off the presses no puppy piss. I'm kind of, I'm kidding. No, but I mean, if you're into that kind of thing, he's not. But if you're not, give me a call. Yeah, he, he can make it happen. But <laughs> got plenty of it over here. Yeah, go to bluechew.com. It's made with the same active ingredients as Viagra and Cialis, so you know it works. I'm telling you, it works because I've used it. Look, I'm 40 years old and 42 now, and I have a lot of stress in my life. And believe it or not, and I thought it was always a bullshit excuse but when you have a lot of stress your libido doesn't quite work the same especially at my advanced stage at 42 of course so you take the blue chew and it really helps you power through some of your problems trust me on that and it's five dollars shipping and handling you spend five dollars on stupid stuff all the time your moco cappuccino latte frappa thingies and your young bucks pens and what whatever i mean stop for just one day and go to bluechew.com use the promo code perspective have eli send you out a shipment and make your spouse happy in bed don't do it for you because look you we all know you and I'm talking to you, whether you're in your car or on a bus right now. We know you don't care. You want to wham, bam, thank you, ma'am, get done before the start of the second quarter of the football game. But do it for her because she'll stick around longer if you do it. And she'll appreciate that you're going the extra mile for her. That's okay. right. Get yourself, a, get yourself a stress-free boner. Thank you. A stress-free boner. I like that. <laughs> that. That's my addition to this. I like that. So go to Blue Chew, do all that stuff. It helps keep the podcast going, and right there alone is why you should do it. And if you can't do it and you've already done it, get your friend to do it. And then steal his blue chew because he probably won't use it. So I don't care. Just order it. You know, beg, borrow, and steal. I don't care how you do it, but go do it. Is that a good sales pitch? For the best you, blue chew. (laughs) Like always coming up with that stuff. Eli, where can people find you? They can find me at the Eli Drake on Twitter and Instagram. 
they can buy my beautiful, wonderful T-shirts at ProWrestlingTees.com slash Eli Drake. Soon to be, there will be a shirt on the NWA uh, merchandise. Uh, what we call that? Uh, website, whatever. Uh, <laughs> there, there will be an NWA uh, Eli Drake shirt available here shortly. Uh, and what else do I have? Uh, NWA. Into the Fire, coming December 14th, and of course, Power, every Tuesday, 6.05 p.m. at YouTube.com slash NWA. No independent bookings yet? Uh, man, I'm, I'm keeping it pretty clear at this point, just kind of staying healthy, not like independent bookings were keeping me unhealthy, uh, but at this point, it's at the NWA's discretion. I am exclusive, so if anybody would like to book me, you have to contact David Lagana via David J. Lagana. You know what? I'm not going to give out his... Uh, I'm not going to give out his email here. Uh, if you'd like to book at, me, at Juno. Catch me at ca- catch me at uh, uh, book Eli Drake at gmail.com, and then I will forward you to the proper channels. Oh man, maybe I'll try to book you as a guest on this podcast. There you go. That's a good idea. Yeah, I'll host and book. I'm um, book host and be a guest. And we've been flirting about adding a guest here and there on the show. We don't want to be too guest heavy, but every once in a while, I think. This is probably something we'll talk about later, and we've kind of flirted through texts back and forth about bringing on a guest here and there and that may like wrestling and may be a wrestler, but I don't know. We're kind of having fun right now doing it, just you and I. That's right. Let's not uh, let's not bring anybody else in until we need to. All right. Well, listen, head over to WrestlingPerspectivePodcast.com. There you can get all the links to... Everything you need from the podcast to Eli's social media, wherever it is, you can go there. Any place you get podcasts, that's where Wrestling Perspective is. So feel free to type in Wrestling Perspective. Make sure you subscribe, uh, rate, leave a comment if that's available on whatever you do. It helps us move up algorithms and rankings and blah, 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 blah. Uh, follow me on Twitter at dennis 77 Farrell. I think that's about it, Eli. Well, by the way, one more thing. Uh, If anybody does, uh, if anybody's in the California area or can get to the California area, I have these two beautiful little pit bull uh, puppies. They are about eight weeks old. They are fantastically fun, friendly, happy, uh, and they are needing a home. So contact me, DM me on Instagram, (laughs) and uh, I can make that happen for you too if you want some furry friends. Will you ship them like Blue Chew? Uh, I will, yeah, I'll, I'll ship them right in the box. We'll, we'll cellophane around them. We'll be ready to go. <laughs> poke, poke some holes in the <laughs> box. Right. No, well, wait, yeah, so, so that's why I need you guys to be in the California area. So if you have any California uh, listeners or somebody close by who can make it out here to pick these puppies up, come get yourself a forever friend. Give them a forever home. They are the sweetest little guys you've ever seen. You're not going to keep one, or can you even keep one in your apartment? Uh, at this point, the plan is to just be a foster daddy, if you will, and to continue foster all the uh, puppies in need up until they get adopted. Here, here, here's one thing people don't know about you, and I was shocked to find this out. Like Once a week, you go to a place, and you go and walk dogs. The, like. It still blows me away because that is not what I would envision Eli Drake doing in his free time, which I still think it's awesome. So now that you're kind of a free agent, right, are you going to another shop to do this again? Are you going to kind of go into dog walking retirement? What is your what is your pet uh, exercising plans for your future? <laughs> well, well, I'm going to have to find a new place to go because I don't even know if the place that I've been going to is uh... – uh, going to be open still or not. I, a lot of people were hitting me up because there was this whole news story that happened where it, there was some sort of thing where one of the one of the girls who worked there picked one of the dogs up and like threw it across the room and it was a it was an awful scene. And for now, I don't know if it's temporary or what, the, the damn place has been shut down and people were yelling at me on Instagram that I support this place. I'm like, well, I, I, I didn't support any place. I wouldn't support the dogs. I didn't give them any money. I gave them my time uh, to go walk the dogs maybe about two or three times a week. Um, and that was it. Uh, I didn't finance them. They weren't paying me, nothing like that. It was just basically I go in and for about, you know, 30, 45 minutes to an hour, just go and walk multiple dogs, just get them out socialized, get them outside, just kind of, you know, help them get around. And then, uh, and that was it. And now at, the, at this point it was like, okay, well, I'm going to foster some puppies, bring them home. Um, you know, kind of help out a little more. So at this point I might need to find a new place to go. Uh, cause I don't even know if that place is going to open back up now. And even if they do, it's kind of like, 
uh, the block's a little hot right now, so I might have to uh, <laughs> might have to just find a new place to go volunteer. But we'll we'll see what happens. All right, there we go. Hey, Eli, this week's show over. I guess we'll put a pin in it. Sure. Yeah. I guess we're we're over time, right? Uh, way over. We're at an hour and a half. So uh, we don't we don't have a time limit here. We don't. Is there anything else you want to talk about then? I don't know. I mean, we could go three hours one time if you want. Can Can we go Broadway? Let's do it. Not. Tonight, I can though. talk all damn day long. Let's not not tonight. Let's we can do a marathon episode, but maybe maybe Thanksgiving week or something because. People will be driving to their grandma's or their parents' house, and they need something to listen to in the car, and we can provide that, but I'm done. I, You know what? I hate the fans so much, I'm calling it a night. Damn. It's like that. Yeah, for me at least. All right, guys. Thanks so much for listening. We'll see you guys next week. Eli, thank you, my friend. Good night, everybody.